streaming. So Mark or rather, we're recording and will be streaming. Mark has done the whole thing on Monday. I just wanted to go over the pension mechanism you asked about. I tried to explain over the phone and I could. Uh, so here we got the phrase, the fox jumps over the top. So it sounds subjective. And so each one of these is an input. So I label x1 to xn. And the way we do it in an attention mechanism is we have three weight matrices, which is WQ, WK, and WV. Right? Here's the query. It's supposed to be like that. That's a magnifying glass. <laughs> yeah, this is it. <laughs> That's a query. Here's the E. It's supposed to be something like that. And here is the <laughs> great artistry. <laughs> great artistry, <laughs> there <it> is. <laughs> so you have this three weight matrix, and the way they interact is um, so you calculate the query, the key, and the value for each one of the inputs. And so for uh, the word date, for example, you calculate Q1, which is the weight matrix, times uh, X1, which is the input. And then similarly, you calculate the key for each one of them. So for the key K1, is the weight matrix, WK, times the input, X1. So they share this weight matrix here. Yeah. So, so you're saying essentially right now, if, if I'm a cortical column and I'm, and I'm choosing, I'm going through my process of figuring out which of these to attend to. Like maybe I'm the cortical column that's over the word jumps, but I'm still looking at these other, uh, I'm still considering how much I want to bring these into it. I'm going to just assign keys to each of these uh, to essentially, you can think of a key as assessing, saying like, this is a noun, or this is a, this a, just sort of. Uh, it's some sort of value on, um, on what the other words are. Too. Yeah, so I'm sort of just kind of assessing what it is. So, so confused what a key is. So the query is just the current input. So the query that? is this weight matrix, that we can, uh, multiplied by the input. The current input. At, at yeah. Uh, not, not all the inputs, just at the current input. Yeah, we are just doing the X1 right now. Right? And right. then what is the key? So the key is the same thing. It's the, the weight word. matrix. <laughs> it's a different weight matrix, but it's multiplied by each of the inputs. So I have a key for each one of them. Right? And that key can be reused. So when I go to jumps, I can reuse the same keys there. Uh, well, so you think okay. the um, last two? So, uh, okay, let me see. So, I, so, is, so, so, is the query, so the query is the weight matrix times the current input. This so some matrix. representation of the current input. Yes. And, and the key is some multiplying uh, some representation of all the context around it. Yes, exactly. Uh, times different weight uh, matrices. Right. It's a different weight okay. matrix, that's perfect. So there's some representation of all the other inputs, and this is some representation of the current input. And then to get well, the but you, And you multiply all those others, or you just, or just separate, there's, there's an array of them? Uh, yeah, there is a... It's just a list of these. It's just, you can, it's in a matrix, but you can think of it as, you know, a set of mm -hmm. vectors. And N is kind of the context that you're looking at around yes. the current input. Yes, exactly. Okay. So you're going you're gonna to have this key multiplied by all the context, all the other inputs. And then the way you get the attention is you, you're going to multiply... It, I'm sorry, isn't that a limit to the system? I mean, sometimes the context yes. has to be very, very far away. Then, no, you have, it sounds like you have to hard code the context. I know, but the, yeah. in reality, sometimes the context is far away. You know. So, so that's exactly what people are working on right now, like uh, trying to find ways of going around that. So there are solutions like doing hierarchical approaches or using yeah. sparse um, uh, sparse context, you could say. Yeah. But there are solutions to that. This is just like the regular yeah. transformer approach. So you define the context. Okay. Let's say I want right, to look right. at so the that's a, that, that is a very severe limit to the system. You yeah. have to, and of course, things get much more complicated the bigger n is. Yeah. yeah the computational these jumps go up a lot. Actually. So, uh, so we get the, the key for the current input, and we get um, the query for the current input, and the key for all the other inputs. And then you're going to multiply, get a dot product between the query and the key. And you run a softmax over all of this. So what you get in the end is you have a probability distribution that's going to tell you how much uh, attention you should pay to each one of the uh, inputs. Right. So after you run the softmax, you're going to have the distribution is going to look like this. For example, you're going to have a high value in the current input, which is actually more relevant, and then you're going to have a lower value for all the, the other inputs as well. Does this make sense? Actually, in this case, you would think that the the value for the current input, the word the, would be low because 
really the is about Fox. And so you, yeah. you think that you'd have a higher one for Fox than for the word the. You, you're probably right. Maybe maybe you learned like a, a different uh, value. Okay. Okay. So that, that value tells you how important that particular context is yes. in understanding this current input. Exactly. How does that... Okay, so now I have this this uh, array of weights and, right. and weights that tells me what the relative values of these things are. How does that actually get manifest in the network? I mean, all right, I got an array of numbers here, and, and then I have these bunch of vectors for each word. Okay. What happens? Okay, I'm going to catch that. <laughs> That's a good question. That's the multiplexer, right? This is just how you set up the values for the multiplexer. Yeah, this is how you set up the, the attention. Oh, I always coming up next. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> then you have another third representation. So you have this other weight matrix, which is the value. And you're going to multiply by each of the inputs as well. So you got v1, v2 up to vn. What do you, what do you mind multiplying times? Uh, it's a... It's a uh, dot product as well, so it's the weight matrix times the input. Same way you, you Is it the same the weight matrix. matrix for all of them? No, it's, you have a different weight matrix, one for the query, one for yeah. the key, one for the value, but then you share across all the... No, but I'm saying if I look at what the... It is, yes. V1 says WV X1, and then it says WV X2. It, so is that the same WV? That's WV? the same weight matrix, yeah. That's one of the... That's why it's uh, very efficient. Uh, you actually get... Okay, so I don't, I don't know what that WV represents, but okay. So, so this is the weight matrix to calculate the values. As you have one for the queries, one for the keys, and one for the values. Oh, this is how I'm. This is this is how I'm just. Well, I'm not, okay. But I'm thinking I haven't taken advantage yet of the this number you created. Okay, so that's the next point. So I, I get a value for each one of them. Yeah. And then my new representation is I'm just gonna sum up. So I'm uh, gonna I multiply see. the value I got by the attention. It's going to be a percentage, like a probability distribution here. And then I'm just going to sum up all this. It's going to be V1 times so I'm really one. So I'm really just summing a bunch of vectors. You are. Exactly. Literally just adding them up based yeah. on, uh, based the on this. Is, yeah. It's a weighted sum. The weighted yeah. sum. It's a weighted sum. Yeah, but you base based on your, your attention age. Yeah. yeah. But it's a sum. Yeah, maybe maybe uh, maybe I can draw it a little bit pictorially, and you can tell me if I'm wrong. Right. Um, on this, uh, um, if you if you didn't do any attention, it would be you would have a node here and you have an input, right? And you do a weighted sum here, so yeah. you would just do this thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you would just literally do some weight matrix times the current input, right? That's followed by nonlinear. That's yeah. like the standard feature. Yeah. And in addition, now there's this other thing here, which says, oh, not only am I going to do this. But I'm going to look at all of the context here and here, and then for every context point here, I'm going to give a weight value as to how important that context is, and then this is going to be multiplied into here. Yeah. Right. So I'm going to modify the in, the normal input processing I'm going to do by how important the, the context is. Yeah. Is that a reasonable yeah. way of looking at it? Is. Um, and that's. Uh, so it's a modulatory impact on the actual yeah. uh, thing. And yeah. this is where I think the dendritic stuff uh, can fit in. Yeah. So the one question I have is, how is each, uh, what's the process of uh, converting each word into each of the x1 vectors? All right, that's a good question. Um, so what we had before all this was the, we had recurrent neural networks, right? And the, the issue with recurrent neural networks, I'm going to get that. So uh, mm -hmm. I explain why I'm getting that. And the issue with recurrent neural networks is that you had to process them uh, in sequence. And then you had an issue because you have, in order to process here, your uh, second input, let's say x prime 2, uh, you needed to process x prime 1 first. And that's an issue. And at first, they introduced attention recurrent neural networks not to solve the computing issue, but to solve, uh, to get uh, better, um, better accuracy. And then we had the recurrent, and then we had the pinch. So we had this guy paying attention not only to this guy, but also to past ones. And then this paper, the Transformers paper, but they suggested that you don't need the recurrence at all. You only need the attention mass, since you're already paying attention. But that, it just seems very uh, unbrain-like, right? I mean, we don't, I don't, I don't read by looking at, you know, N words, Processing them, then shift in n word to process, shift n word to process. Right. Them, right. I read them in, in some sort of you know sequential form. But you can think of Sometimes this as an image. Sometimes I go back. Right. What's this, that? This is a, a sentence, but you can think think of as an image with four pixels. 
and then you can. It's going to be X. I know, but if I'm, I'm, if I'm really thinking about language, where the, the, right, right, right. Uh, I mean, so so maybe the examples are used in language and they're using it for language, and, and I don't think it makes sense from a brain point of view in language. Now, from a vision point of view. Um, it, there's a similar argument could be made, right? Uh, you could argue that in a single fixation point, maybe a mechanism is like this is going on. But when we think about attention and vision, we, we know it's a sequential saccades and fixations. Right. And, and so this could be a, a subset of what attention is in vision. It can't be everything that attention is. But then you got, you got the, 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 sac, the saccade is going to focus the, the fovea, that's how I say it in English. Yeah. In a specific point, but you still have some preferred position of what's around it, right? Yeah, but, but clearly, you know, we, we, we now understand this pretty well, at least partially, that when you're doing this, it's not like you're just, this isn't just looking at the same picture from different points, but you're processing it as a picture. It, the, the order and, the, and the, the, the order which it occurs and what's happening in each saccade is very sophisticated. It's not mm -hmm. like just shifting the image around, it doesn't really make a difference. Um, it really is an active processing element, so this doesn't account for that. Right. One could argue that during a fixation, that maybe this kind of thing is occurring uh, spatially over some part of the image, um, perhaps, but what most neuroscientists would call attention, this doesn't capture that. Right. One of the things you can look at is the fact that uh, uh, from early age we're taught to process the sentence sequentially. But there are other ways of processing it. That's what speed reading is about, where you can you basically jump over and look at a gestalt of segments of the same and pull the meaning out of it like that. So the fact that we most people don't do it that way because the way that they were taught doesn't mean that there isn't some capability for actually looking at these things in larger groupings, which you probably capture with this. I think I think I would take an exception to that, Kevin. I think we all read uh, by grouping. You you start by one one letter at a time, then you do three letters at a time, and you're a word at a time. But you know, I Lucas wrote that sentence on the board. I recognize that entire sentence. I know that sentence, so I actually don't have to go through all the words. I just you know. So when I read, your brain automatically is grouping things as big a group as you can. Right. And you recognize entire phrases. This is how. This is why you miss misspellings in, in the middle of things. You just don't see them because you just recognize them the entire thing. So, I always thought that speed reading was just practicing to doing that uh, to a greater and greater extent. Well, it, it is. I mean, it, but it's not a different way of reading. Well, what the example you just gave is is that's an iconic thing, and so you can recognize it. You know, in, in one shot, that's fair. But if you're given novel content. Um, it's how you, in some ways, with, with speed reading, you're you're able to find this this the structure, and you're able to get the meaning of it yeah. without you know voicing it internally. Let's say. Yeah, I think that's a that's a fair thing. I, I guess I was thinking that normal reading, to my mind, normal reading is similar to speed reading. Uh, what you're trying to do is that exact thing. You're trying not to vocalize it, mm -hmm. which takes training. Yeah. Uh, but I think other than that, it's the same. Even when I'm reading novel things, there's always subsets of of, um, of you know the, the the sentence or whatever that I recognize, or even just a very complex word is com is composed of multiple um, uh, you know um, syllables, and you just recognize them all at once. Or sometimes you don't. If it's a really complex word you haven't seen before, you have to spell it out. So I, I think I think the vocalization is a bigger issue. But I don't think I think normal reading is, is also this grouping all the time. But you still have to jump through it, and you still have to go through sequentially. And reading is never ever not going through sequentially. But we don't do this. We don't have a little window that moves along. Right? That's not the way we read. We jump around quickly. Well, and the other uh, uh, point is is that when you, if this thing is meant to uh, process the structure of what you're looking at into an intermediate format, that you can then go out to other languages. So we know, uh, and in other languages, the verb will come first. You know, or the structure will be different. So I'm, I'm getting to that. I was okay. going to answer a question and answer this. Oh, okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so the thing is, uh, you had this notion of sequence before, and then when you remove that in attention is all you need, then you don't have the sequence anymore, right? Then all you have is just a fully connected graph, right? And you don't know which word comes first, since each one of them are looking at all of them. And then, so what you have to do to fix this is. Oh, wait, wait, is, but isn't the, the aren't the weights the attentional weights dependent on the order of the words? Uh, no. Really? Because no, you're looking at all of them, 
as it is, right? So but, there's but, no well, I, guess I just don't have a good intuition about how neural networks work then because I would have thought that you would have ended up with different weights if the language had different orders of words in them. Um, right, but, but here you have uh, no notion of the position of the word. Like you can't tell if over is... You can't tell, but the weights you got were based on the orders of words in the past. Right. Right, so that's, it's not like there's no knowledge of the orders of the there words. There is some knowledge, yeah. But yeah. what people did to fix this is... So in this representation here, that's what Kevin uh, asked. Just, just, to, just to throw this in here, there's, this dog is no closer to this fox than it is to this dog. Like, the, there's, no, there's nothing spatial in the network, right? Right. The, the, so there's, there's nothing, the network has no way of, of ordering these. Well, aren't these weight matrices determined from past, past learning where that order was important? Um, uh, at some point, it, but it can learn. I mean, the structure is there to learn that dog might be a lot more relevant than fox. Like, it has no way, has no... Um, uh, by the way, I might have confused the conversation right. a little bit there. I just, I, what I just told you was strictly true, but then they go and they change the embeddings. They go and put into the letters to, to I, give a position. So if I, if I swap fox and dog, the result would be the same, or would it be different? Yeah. No, it, it would be the same if you don't uh, change the embedding, right? That's the thing. But the thing they do is the embedding here next one. So how do you represent it? You're going to represent using an embedding, like using glove or any sort of word embedding we have, with a distributed representation. And then you add, so you have like a distributed representation here, but then you add something that tells its position, that tells this is position one, this is position two, this is position three. So you add that to the embedding, so that's in the representation of the word. So this is how the network is going to know which position that thing was. But if you don't have this, then there is no way the network is going to know. Are the WK is all the same across? It's all the same, yeah. yeah. Okay. So if you don't add this to the embedding, like a yeah. position embedding, it's not. Yeah, going to I can see that. Yeah. It's funny the trick they use. Maybe this isn't unexpected, but they they use like essentially multiple oscillators in a way that almost resembles the grid cells in alpha. Really? Uh, I mean, it's oscillators. Well, like multiple, multiple <laughs> oscillators going at different. It's kind of a logical. I've never heard of a neural network having you know artificial neural network having oscillators. I, when I say oscillator, I mean like that they, they the, the way they're the way they're in cho choosing to add a set of bits to this, a set of bits to this, a set of bits to this. Um, the way they get like a position code where you can somehow use a weight matrix oh, to I figure see. out. Instead of just saying code. one, two, three, they have a mechanism which is. So this is the delta code. Uh, it's just, or is, or is it an offset so code? Or is it no, it's essentially assigning a, a, a position code to each of these that sort of resembles a grid cell code uh, in the sense that you can calculate displacements between them. So, um, so there's multiple periodicities. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's a very, very important issue there now. Because now you're saying they've used a sort of a metric framework for representing position of the words. Yeah. I mean, as soon as you can say, I can determine the distance, that's a metric framework. Yeah, distance in terms of numbers of words away. Okay, yeah. fine, it's a distance, um, but that's a metric space. Which but the original transformer paper had like absolute position, but then the XL one has relative position. That's what I meant by the delta code. Yeah, it's yeah, a yeah, relative yeah. position. Plus one, minus one, plus two. Yeah, okay. But, but, the but that's used all over the I mean, that's used a lot. Well, I, I, I don't know what you mean used a lot. We're I mean, just saying that. This word is one away from the one I'm looking at. This one's two away yeah, from what yeah, I'm looking at. Yeah. I mean, that's a very basic. I understand, but it's not. Really. It's not typically in most neural networks that you have that kind of stuff, right? I mean, do you, if you do a vision network, do you have any concepts like that? Um, I think evolution. it's implicit in the, in the <laughs> network. Um, I'm really confused. A plus one, minus one. You're saying they just append one plus one plus two. No, no. I'm just. I'm just. One show its relative. To the position, not an absolute position. Because the first one, they had like an absolute position over the window. Like this is in position 700 of the window. Then they, they encode that. But in the new transformers, they use like relative position, like a, some delta coding. Okay, I don't know what the new ones do. Sure. I guess, uh, yeah, it's what you're saying. Like, yeah, this is uh, two to the left, two to the right. Instead of saying this is in position 700 of yeah, the screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so what, what happens? So you do this, you have some end window. You process it. Right. Then they move over one word. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, how do they? How do the different uh, steps are integrated? So I have this pass through non time related one step that looks at n words. Right. Then I have another time step where I'm looking at n minus one of the same words. Well, how do those two things interact? Right. So I'm just going to say the big thing here 
And the big breakthrough is that they can be parallelized, right? I don't have to go to step one and then step two and then step three. I can run all of them at the same time. Oh, but run all of them, like all the different shifts of N, you mean? Well, basically the yeah. network, I think what you're saying is that the output of the network is completely independent of what it output the previous time step. So I don't have to run for it's not like it's a recurrent. It's not but a that's true for the n words. Right. But how is that true for the next shift? No, I mean, it is not. Just inside this big. Yeah. Board, all right. So, now, so now I basically paralyze this whole thing of n words. Yeah. But but the, to do anything realistic, I have to move over and do other words. Yes, I do. So, so how when you shift over to the next word, right. and the center is the next word. You don't use any of the activations from the previous. No, no, but you reuse right. the weights. You reuse okay, the weights, yeah. Right. The weight. So these are very... It's not like a temple memory which is continuing... No, no, not the next no, word. But that's what Jeff was asking. Yeah, yeah, there's, yeah, no, yeah. Like, there's no connection between... No, no. By the time I move n steps over, there's absolutely no knowledge of anything that occurred more than n steps ago. I mean, it's... Yeah, so, it's not like our temple memory. So there's how, no but there's no knowledge then. It like, seems so limited. No, it's like just given this window, what is your prediction? This given this current context, yeah. and it's completely independent of So that else. doesn't that seem like a huge restriction? That prediction isn't fed into the next one at all? Like that new representation? But that it's not changing the next uh, prediction set? Well, it's changing, it's, it's changing the weight, right? Like, Okay, it's your point. But Imagine inside the window, the next end is not changing. So, like, the fox jumps over the dog, and then that, yeah. that's like uh, six words. So, next, let's say the next six words are because the dog had fleas on its nose or something like that, right? Um, I don't know, whatever. And so, when I get to that next set of words, I have absolutely zero knowledge about what happened earlier. I can't, there's nothing I can. Well, but the knowledge are in the weight, right? You, you just but the knowledge, the but no, the no, weights well, once are it's trained, once it's doing inference, you yeah. change the weights. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so after that point, it, that, it just means like I, there's no knowledge. That, it's just like a very limited window in which you could, unless you make n really large. That could be right. Yeah. N is usually like really large. In this transformer, like, like we're 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 power at this problem and it goes away. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I heard that yeah. summer school people are doing this like up to a million. These like big models like GPT two kind really? of. Okay. Yeah, like they got the whole text. That kind of seems old. really hacky to me. It, it is. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'm not <laughs> saying that is not. the way to HEI. Yeah. That yeah. is the way. I'm not arguing in favor of it. Okay. I don't see why any of this surprises you. Well, I'm hoping for new insights. I'm hoping to find some, you know, new things. Well, just, there are some new insights here. Okay, yeah. that's fine. But, but it, I think that's what suicide just summarized it well. He said, you know, that's the way to AGI. You hack your way there, as opposed to like fundamentally dealing with the problem. Uh, I mean, we certainly don't read that way. Yeah. I don't, look at all, I don't look at all words in some article and, and process them in the right words at once. So there, 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 is, there is one fundamental change here, which is that allowing the in a sequence, allowing the past and the future to. I, the, I want, that's, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying this is an additional idea on top of what I would consider traditional attentional mechanisms, which are required. It doesn't get rid of those the, the traditional attention mechanism. This is an additional idea about spatially you can incorporate local uh, uh, spatial knowledge in parallel, something like that. And I'm not sure if this occurs in the brain or not, but it's, in, it's an additional step. It's certainly not like this is what attention is. This is like, oh, maybe this is a twist on what attention is. I just uh, want to add this is a but, simplification as well. There's more, actually. Oh, is that okay? There's, there's a little bit more. Uh, this is just one hat. That's, so what we do is we have multiple hats, using the multiple first one, uh, hats. Hats. Heads. 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 So single like head heads. attention, oh. multi head attention. Oh, I don't know that word. So this is all one head. This is all one head. What does that mean? Is that a neural uh, a machine learning term? Yeah. Heads? It's, it's introduced in this paper. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this is one head. So what they had in Trasha, they had eight of these heads. And what you do is you concatenate all of them. So you get, let's say you get three heads, you concatenate. And then it goes to a feed forward uh, network, and then you go back to... Uh, What's the difference between the heads? They have different weight matrices. They, they have different weight matrices, so you can learn different... Uh, each head can learn different way of paying attention. You could or say that. is each head looking at a different part of the text, or...? They, well, they must be trained differently. Yeah, they're trained, right? It's how, do they tra how do you train them differently? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you don't, actually. You just... You have eight heads, and then you have the well, flexibility so, to... If they all train the same data, wouldn't they be identical? Well, no, in this, in this way... Here, each of these blocks that's looking at different relative positions, yeah. 
they're all using the same weight matrix. Yeah. So it's just using the same rule for deciding yeah, whether yeah, 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 something yeah, yeah, is relevant yeah, yeah, yeah. or not. So now you can have eight rules. I got it, but, but why would those rules, during training, why would they be well, different? One answer is just initialize the weight yeah, matrix. Yeah, they'll be randomly different. Uh, and then they'll land uh, in different places. Yeah, yeah, it's like hedging your bets at some old Yeah, yeah that's more of like, that's more of like, just sort of yeah. average out the, the craziness. Yeah, so and as it, opposed to like, I didn't train one head on scientific articles, another head on history. But they are, they are, all trained at the same time, so that they do have like a benefit to move away from each other and kind of specialize. Yeah, because um, the error might be lower if you had two separate distinct heads than if yeah. you had one. Okay, you know, two fine. It's, it's a it's a would be sort of sort of random forest type of thing. You're just doing a bunch of them so that they average out their errors, or something like that. And then you can see this is not very different from convolution. So like this new representation we learned, x one prime, uh, it has a little bit of everything else, right? And that's kind of what you want in a convolution. Like you go over this window, and this window is going to be mapped to one pixel into, into the next image. So it's not that different from a convolution operation like Gary's pointing out. And they actually showed in a new paper that if you use enough heads, and you use a, this multi-headed transformer in a vision approach, you get a convolutional neural network. You can actually, this is going to learn to be a convolutional neural network. There's a new paper showing that. And I've so also seen people say they, they use temporal convolutional networks to replace transformer, and it's apparently a lot more efficient. I don't know what I think for convolutional network. Uh, it's just, just going over time instead of space. Instead of space. I mean, because yeah. they did that before transformer came along, so, uh, so maybe it's... No, it was, this was new. This was like last year. Okay, so solving this problem, problem with convolutional neural networks isn't new. But, um, but maybe there's a new version that I'm just not aware of. Yeah, let's see if I I'll see if I can find the paper. But they said it's much more efficient in terms of weights, and it performs better on the benchmarks. And at least that's what that paper claimed. I saw, I saw a tweet where was funny. Somebody posted this paper and said, "Whoa, they reinvented convolution." <laughs> <laughs> so, so what's the mechanism for the multi heads for them to be differentiated from each other? What forces them? Uh, apart from different initialization, I'm not sure. There might be well, some well, Marcus suggested they, they were competitive in some sense. Yeah, they, well, they are just because backprop does that. Uh, if, if, if one part of the network is already accomplishing something for you, uh, then... Oh, so uh, they, train, but they train it with multiple heads? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I yeah. thought they had multiple heads were trained independently, and then no, no, they all tra everything's trained together. I, I mean, just like having a yeah, layer okay. with twenty uh, units. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why don't the units all end up the same? Exactly. Because no, right. I, I didn't understand. It. I thought you were saying, oh, train a network and train another network and train another, and now combine. No, no, no. Um, they're yeah, all it's trained. All one, but this is all it, part of the process. All, yeah, yeah, all yeah, one process. ginormous yeah, network. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. hundred billion parameters or whatever. Wow. GPT-2 is one point five billion parameters. Yeah. How much? One point five billion. No, the newer the I thought the biggest was seventeen. Uh, in Christie's chart it was like seventeen billion. That's seventeen Microsoft. billion? Yeah, it's wow. So yeah, three months. Alright, so this is like no stopping progress. <laughs> so like as I've as I've looked at these and thinking thought about like what what do these correspond to in the brain? Um, this this notion of keys, uh, this notion of like scanning everything and and assigning it a key. First thing that comes to mind for me is saliency maps. Uh, the idea that you scan your visual field, figure out where the salient places are. That's that's sort of like a binary key. It's like either zero or one. There's a salient thing here. There's a salient thing here. Uh, and the, um, the, this is a more general version of that. The, the notion that you would yeah, scan everything, get a big sense of what's there, so that everyone can attend to it as they please. Everyone is f figuring out their own queries. Everyone's figuring out where they want to attend to. Maybe attention is the wrong word here. Mm -hmm. Maybe that maybe it should be routing. But um, that's that's kind of the general idea. That's where that's where I put the K. Mm -hmm. so, so then each each head would be a different saliency map in some sense. That's a good point. Uh, yeah. Yeah. If that gets the saliency yeah. Yeah, you're right, yeah. Thing. Yeah. So I, I, it's a long time ago someone uh, kind of positive thing that in image processing, you know, do you start top down, do you start bottom up? And their notion was find the most prominent feature and work outwards from there. So that's kind of your saliency idea. If you have something that is stands out as distinguishable, lock onto that and then work outwards from that. So I think, you know, when I when I look for scanning text, I'm looking for certain salient words or something else, something I either don't recognize or something that uh, looks key to me and that I will focus my attention around that. So I, I agree with your analogy. 
That's that that's been studied a lot in vision, you know, Kevin, how you know how people do that and all these tests, these sort of things. It seems to explain only part of what we do when we see con. Um, uh, it just yeah, it's just part of it. Uh, but I agree with you. What I thought was appealing here was like, you know, this issue of like the word the, for example. It's not doesn't contain a lot of information. And and I was just hearing you talk about that. I said, yeah, well the thing where if I see the word the, I actually want to most likely attend to the next thing. You know, like, really, this is about the next thing. The word the is not important. The word fox is the important thing. And so the idea that, that um, you know, that, that that sort of could be inherently done spatially uh, or in parallel, uh, I don't know, this struck me as a little bit interesting. All right. That was, All right. That's yeah. interesting. That's my topic. All right. Cool. I bet you it took more than 10 minutes. Yeah, I bet they did. <laughs> <laughs> The bar has been set. Yeah. Have a one minute talk. I, well, I don't, think, I don't think mine will be one minute. I think it'll be five minutes. My, my topic here is a very simple thing that may seem, seem obvious, but it struck me as something I had never thought about before. And so whenever I see something I haven't thought about before, it kind of sticks in my brain and go, oh, that's something to file away to remember. Um, so I was reading uh, Scientific American last night, and there was an article about. Um, Myelin sheath on de- on on oh, accent. Okay. And and myelin sheath on what, sir? Myelin sheath. I, so I don't I won't assume everyone knows what this is. So I'll explain. Myelin sheath on what? Well, axons. axons. So here oh, goes. I see. Here you go. Here's what it looks like. Oh, that's here, like, yeah. You got a neuron, it is an axon, and the axon goes someplace. It's to you know, it can go it can be local or it can go long distances. And so it might go to if this was a cortex, you and these are your six layers. Then it might leave down here, go over 10 centimeters and go up someplace else, or it might go down into the spinal cord, something like that, right? Or another neuron, the, the axon might just go locally, it doesn't go very far. So uh, spikes travel along the axon all the way to the end. They always go all the way to the end, they never, they never not get all the way to the end. But the speed at which they travel is pretty slow. Uh, and so the <coughs> trick that the, the, trick that the brain uses to speed it up is, in some cases, if it's very local, if you're only going like, a, you know, a, Hundred microns or something like that. You know the speed is fine, but if you want to go ten centimeters or thirty centimeters, the speed can be really problematic. So the trick that nature does is they they wrap the um, the the axon in fat, and the fat is uh, is that's the myelin sheath. It is an insulator, and um, and I, I, I'll go through the details a little bit of this uh, in case you might be curious. Um, Essentially, normally, when a spike travels down an axon, it is always opening and closing of, uh, of ion gates. That's how it travels, right? You have to, there's a local voltage change that opens a gate, which allows in ions, which then moves it, so it's that change in the voltage, opens a gate, and that process is pretty slow. And it just goes like, it's basically opening gate, opening gate, opening gates as you travel along. And when you put a fatty insulator around it, that doesn't happen between the ends of the insulator. And so what happens is you open and close gates here, it changes the voltage, but the voltage transmit goes, the voltage change goes all the way down to this next node here, where it opens and closes there, and which goes down to the next node. So this is a, this is a voltage, uh, um, uh, a voltage um, gradient, which is very quick, as long as the wire is insulated. And then so instead of, instead of, uh, instead of going open, 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 it goes open, jump, open, jump, open, jump. And that makes it go really fast. Just as a note, it's not only the speed, it's also uh, the current leaks, the voltage leaks if you don't insulate it. Yes. So it will die. But well, it doesn't, no. It, it, it attenuates, definitely. Uh, spikes always get to the end. Oh, yeah, because they're usually insulated, or it's a short period of time. So no, long range protection. My, you might know more of it, but my understanding, even in non-insulated axons, they will always get to the end. Yeah, um, but for very long ones, I mean, they they're always insulated, pretty much. No, like you have you have pain, uh, slow pain receptors coming from parts of your body that uh-huh. go go a meter or more, and they're really slow, and so that's why you you can like the if you have pain in your gut, my understanding is, uh, it's a very slow response. It's not like a, an acute response, but because the pain the pain axon the spike goes all the way uninsulated. So is I, it really uninsulated? Yeah. Okay. My impression is that. Uh, I, 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 you, you've been in the neuroscience lab more recently than I have, but my understanding is that in the complete, there are very long unsul- uninsulated axons, and it will always get to the end. Uh, it just takes a long time to get there. Most of the time, you don't want to take a long time, and most of the time, it's insulated. Okay. Uh, you can go on. Yeah. I'm a little confused because 
specifically like Blue Berry's disease is the myelin sheath is attacked and it, it doesn't get to the end. It, it gets... Well, there's two things. One, it doesn't get to the end quickly, which is a big problem. If you all of a sudden your signals take a long time to get in where your brain just gets, you know, totally out of sync. Okay. Which gets to the point I'm going to get to. Well, but in this case, if the myelin sheath goes away, you won't have all these other vesicles there. Well, I don't know. So actually, I don't, actually I, I don't know what will happen there. That's a good question. If the myelin sheath goes away and you do not have the ion channels, you the ion channels, sorry. the ion channels, yes, then it won't work. I don't know enough about that disease. I don't okay. know what happens. Okay. Um, uh, but I also believe that actually in, in some of those neurodegenerative diseases, it's not just a myelin sheath. I think the action acts, acts on itself decays and you lose the whole thing. Right. Um, anyway, so this is well-known neuroscience. You have these insulators along here, and it speeds things up. And it turns out that these, these insulators are actually part of a cell. They're, they're part of these, these uh, cells that sort of, and there's a nice picture of it here in this, in this paper here. Um, I hope you can see this. And here's a picture of uh, this, the purple thing is this uh, myelin sheath, and it's part of this cell. Um, that sort of wraps around like a toilet paper roll or something like that, right? <laughs> and um, and it's a living thing. It's not just like some, you know, it's, it's a living thing. And and, um, and this is like a character drawing. You can see how it, the, the little points where, it, and these things are called the nodes of Ringer. That's what they're called. So uh, this has been known for a long time. And um, it's also been known for a long time that the more insulation you have, um, uh, it, it actually uh, it, it progresses faster, and part of that is because of the uh, because there's less leakage, but also because it, it actually the more insulation you have, it squeezes the axon smaller, and and then the uh, there's less capacitance in the thing, and so it jumps quicker. <laughs> so so you can speed up or slow down by increasing the amount of fat and reducing the amount of fat. You can change the speed of propagation along here. Um, it's also been known for a long time that um, with training, if you really practice something a lot, you can end up with more insulin, you meant the insulator, you know, more myelin sheath. So that's kind of been known for a while. I guess, you know, they've shown that, it, they can show that if someone like an athlete or someone who practices something a lot, a musician or something, that you end up with more myelin sheath and, and, and you know, oh yeah, okay, so you're faster at it or better at it. The idea they've introduced here, which I had never heard of before, which I thought was interesting, there are, there are cells uh, there are astrocytes, which are these other type of brain cells that are, uh, uh, that are not neurons. Uh, and they connect right into these nodes of Rainier. I didn't know that. And, um, and they can detect the activity going on here. And they can change the amount of myelin sheath based on that activity. And they propose, well, they didn't give any... They, they said this, but they didn't really didn't give any evidence in this article. I have to read, if I wanted to, I have to read the real articles, uh, the real journal papers. But what they suggested was that part of the learning process, if, if you're going some distance here, you want the signals that are arriving here to arrive at the same time, right? right? And what they're suggesting is that there might be an active process to actively adjust the timing of these things to make things arrive at the same time. And so learning is not just the plasticity of the synapses at the end result, but it's also requires, it, it's, it's, I, they argue this is part of learning. And I, I think it's not, it's not, to my mind, it's not part of the, 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 the it's not part of the, the representation of learning, it's part of the mechanism of learning. This would be required for something like active dendrites to work. Yes. Right? Because yeah, you yeah. want things to arrive precisely within yeah, five yeah. milliseconds. And, and we've always kind of waved our hand at that and said, well, somehow it, it works. I don't know. Anyway. So to me, this is like plumbing as opposed to a new representational scheme. It's not introducing, a, as far as I can tell, it's not introducing a new way of representing data in the brain. It's just a way of making the brain work correctly. But, but, but in some sense, it might actually represent a new way of learning the brain. For example, one could imagine, you could imagine, they didn't write any evidence of this, that, that you could have two sets of signals uh, uh, converging at some point. And they arrive at different time sets, you know, pattern A and pattern B, and then they process separately, something like that. Um, they also didn't explain, other than they didn't ex all they could, they didn't explain how this could occur, because if all you were doing is detecting the amount of spikes going by here on a per second, that, that's kind of a crude system. It doesn't really tell you if the signal got to the end of, of the right time or not. So all that would suggest is like, well, the more spikes I see, the thicker I make this, and the fewer spikes I see, the thinner I make this. Like, it's important, therefore, go faster. So that would be like, but they, 
they suggested that it's an active process both ways, but that it, but they didn't explain how that might work. They didn't explain how it, how that this guy would, how these astrocytes would know whether the signal arrived at the right time or not. They could, they're arguing that you could speed it up or slow it down based on getting it to the end results. So right if there's now. some potentiation at the other end, yeah. if, does that information travel well, they, back somehow? Well, they didn't talk about that. So but that you would be, need something like that. Would, right? You need something like that. That's the obvious, the obvious idea that you'd have sort of a retrograde signal that somehow went back down the axon that these guys could pick up on and say, you know, what happened. If I recall correctly, I think astrocytes also form networks with each yes. other. Yes. Um, so, but this could be a long distance. So, like, I mean, can they form networks that span ten centimeters? I don't know. The you morphology know. of an astrocyte actually has these multiple, you know, projections off of it, so you can see it as a coordination thing. And I remember an experiment where they uh, took human astrocytes, which are much more have like a hundred offshoots, injected it into mice. And they actually took, and they were showing how it seemed to improve their characteristics yeah. on certain traits. So, so the question, though, mm -hmm. is the question is: Are we doing just something like, hey, making these thicker because you're using it a lot? If you're really trying to, to tune this to match the need here, then I don't see how astrocytes on their own can do that because there's, this is to, the distances are far too long for a network of astrocytes to to have it, to do that. It's you know, imagine you have the tiny little cells, and you're going multiple centimeters here. Um, sometimes ten centimeters, sometimes twenty centimeters. How can you possibly, you know, these cells couldn't communicate enough of them. You have millions of them in a network that somehow have to convey information back here. It would take forever. So, to me, the, the more striking opportunity is is the one that you might the sympathizer this. You might have a, a, a retrograde signal that comes back here that indicates. Um, if this were all true, I don't know if it's true, but you know, it, that would indicate like, you know, you gotta speed up or slow down type of thing. Um, yeah, so I was just looking up some old notes. There are all these uh, transport mechanisms inside the axon. Yeah. And there are some really slow ones also that, so there is bi-directional flow of information. Okay. Uh, it just wouldn't be super fast. Yeah, yeah. It, does, yeah. it takes like minutes to hours. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. minutes. Exactly. Oh, yeah. But that would be okay for learning. Well, could it? Uh, there are also chemical mechanisms too in signaling that don't even require to flow along the axon per se, right? You can, the chemical potentials that come out there, there's another... Well, not over layer. these, I don't think that would work over these distances. I, I don't know. I, no, I don't know. Those are very local, I think. Yeah, I don't think so either. It, it's, these are very small, you know, we're talking one micron here, we're going, you know, centimeters, um, you so, know, the 10,000, this, this, this pipe is 10,000 times longer than it's yeah. wide. I mean, but there's like, like several transport and, mechanisms yeah. inside the axon. Yeah. So controversial over. idea, what if it's feedback in the sense that indirectly, the project, those coordinated projections, assuming how well coordinated they are, project onto a neuron or a network of neurons. That network of neurons then directly or indirectly feeds back into the original neurons. Well, how, how, how so? This, this is the connection between them. So. You're saying there's another, there's a feedback projection? A feedback projection that ends up influencing this neuron, for example. Oh, here. so you're saying something like this. Instead of a, a retrograde signal, you have a, you have a retrograde axon, something like that. Yeah, yeah, through some indirect process. And then, you know, you can, like, if you integrate a bit over the timing at the node of Rainier, Rainier there. Yeah, but how do, you, how do you, but that signal has to get to these points. Exactly, so assuming it fired an action potential, and then you can integrate the timing. I don't know. It's, it's that, that means that means that this retrograde ax axon has to go along and intersect all those astrocytes here, like that. Oh no 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 uh, no! What I mean is that the uh, so assuming this neuron fires once, right? This guy. Yeah, it goes down, blah blah blah, and then you know the, the uh, other connections come in at optimal or not optimal timing, and then a neuron there fires back, it projects back to that neuron that fired. The green thing. Yeah, yeah. so maybe this one, in response to that, uh, fires an action potential. And that will be in a X time delay from the initial action. Oh, so it's like a, a very quick feedback, like uh, you're off a little bit. That sort <laughs> and, of thing. And this guy says, okay, I've seen another spike. Meaning like, uh, like if, uh, therefore, send, then, then this astrocyte will see two spikes and they'll say, okay, I need to increase it. Exactly, it will see two spikes in like, yeah. you know, uh, 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds. Yeah. And that's a realistic time frame for over which it can integrate. Yeah. And it's not even necessary that the neuron is firing again in a correction, it's just some other part of its function. You know, there was a... Um, or there could be synchronized signals externally to everything. Yeah. You know, clock signals. and. 
you're trying to get oh, the firing oh. really uh, tied in with but then you know, some that would mean that but then you lose the locality of that okay unless you the clock is globally enforced but then you yeah. wouldn't need that maybe so you're saying yeah, there's, a, there's a global signal and all the astrocytes sites are looking at that global signal and they it, want it, they want the spike to come by at the peak of that signal yeah something like that and okay. so if, if it comes by at the peak of that signal here or good okay but if it's too late over here it says oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what it's gonna do just can I point out something? My, yeah. my, I, I read the article too, and I had an impression that you said you had the accent here, and then you got the reading sheet going on. Yeah. And that the potentiation here, the responsible one was the myelin cell that was getting the signal and growing, and then the depression was was caused by the astrocyte. The astrocyte would go and remove the myelin chip. So okay. you actually had three players. Oh, I, I, if I'm here on, you had I thought, myelin, I thought so. that the astrocyte was doing both. I, I don't, that's what I remember. So then it would require also the myelin chips to get that signal somehow, not just the astrocyte. Mm -hmm. Well, um, yeah, I mean, there was, there was um, I might so be wrong. the myelin chip that these cells called oligodendrite, or dendrocytes. Oligodendrites, yeah. You know, oligodendrocytes, mm -hmm. with a real mouthful. Um, That's okay, it just, it just means fat. <laughs> but it's a cell, it's a type of cell, right. it's not the astrocytes themselves, it's a... Uh, uh, well, I, I might, I, you might, I'm not going to miss that. So you're saying the increase was by one, the decrease was yeah, by one. Yeah, so the myelin would pick up an increase, you know, like wrap up, and then the depression is the astrocyte go and remove it. Okay, so why would the, so somehow the astrocyte know, needs to know to to remove it. And uh, the mining needs to know when to increase it. Well, that's my point. so, you know, one could argue that this, then they're in sort of, either way, there has to be some regulation. So what if, what if the myelin just says, I always want to create more, you know, I always want to create more fat. And then this guy sort of keeps it in control. Then then there's still going to be a graded signal here somehow that says, you know, it, it's, it just buys it. It, it. You still have to have a graded signal that tells to go up and down, and I think I think they were arguing that great signal is the astrocyte. So um, I missed that detail, but I think it doesn't. It's interesting. I think it doesn't. Okay. Um, anyway, I, I just thought it was an interesting idea. I don't think it really impacts anything we did right now, but the idea that this is an active learning mechanism is maybe it's, they didn't make the case that it was. Uh, they didn't, in this article, they didn't make the case to prove that it was just like more speculative. Um, but I thought it was an interesting idea. Yeah, astrocytes are bananas. They do so many yeah. crazy things. Well, why do you call them bananas? What's I just mean? like saying bananas. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're crazy. They're crazy. Oh, crazy bananas. I thought you were like, they're, I'm something. Oh, not like a comparison to actually. Yeah, I thought you were like, <laughs> they're like the bananas in the oil again. And that they have so many like apples. apples. <laughs> <laughs> they're bananas. They're crazy. <laughs> They do lots of different things. Yeah. 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 Is it yeah. possible that there's a kind of a back pressure mechanism? Not like, pressure, but uh, not that's, like, that's what we were saying earlier. That the trans there could be information going back. This transport mechanism right, is just inside the axon. Even, yeah. even just in the sim in a similar sense, then in a transmission mm -hmm. in an electrical transmission line, basically the end uh, being. Um, uh, impedance matched or not? Yeah. But if it's not impedance matched, then you get a then you get a return, sure. and from the return you can actually measure what the impedance mismatch is because yeah. the re return so would be return though, negative. So so axons, if you think of them as wires, they have a lot of problems. Um, they are very leaky. Um, that is, you know, they're like leaky pipes, you know, uh, and um, and so you can't it's you can't. Put a voltage grade in here and expect it to go anywhere. Uh, that's why you. Have could to you have do it across the? Yeah, that's notes. why you have to. Re that's why you have to repeat it. You have to have repeaters here, which actively reinstate the signal, and, and these can't be too far apart. So if, if a signal wants to get from here back to here, it has to get repeated somehow. Um, uh, other than a very slow uh, chemical gradient could go back, but it would be slow. It would be very slow. Um, but I, don't know, I mean, it's like you can't put a, if you put a, a, a voltage spike right here, um, uh, a square wave voltage spike, for example, it, it, it'll it'll dissipate very quickly unless you actively reinstate it. Um, that's why you have to have this these modes right here because they, they're basically repeaters across the ocean floor. You know, you're sending a signal and it has to be repeated as it gets degraded too quickly. So I, it's the right idea, and I just don't. But these are these are really leaky pipes, and they're really they don't work that well. So you have to have active repeaters to get anything the other direction, unless it's a slow chemical gradient, which would be very slow. 
Uh, it could be very slow. It could be the kind of learning that takes you know weeks to get good at, right? But what, you know, you can you can pick up a skill like here. You here's how to play this on the piano, but it takes weeks and weeks and weeks of practice to get good at it. And you can learn it instantly, but to get good at it, it's like you know, to make more memory than it's you know. So I don't know. Who knows? Anyway, I just thought it was an interesting idea. One more thing to stick in my bag of tricks. That's it. Is that five minutes? Was that ten minutes? More like half a minute. Oh. <laughs> I was meaning to ask you about that.